I want to invite the rest of you to go back with me uh, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 10, we were here last Sunday as well, um, just because it gives us a, a wonderful look into multifacets of what we're talking about in this series on the life of the church. So if you're first time in a while, new with us, watching online, uh, we typically go through books of the Bible, and then occasionally we'll have a theme, a doctrinal theme or theological theme, and that's what we're doing this summer. We're talking about the doctrine of the church. We're calling it Church Life by the Book. And um, so we're, uh, I think, our fourth week into that. And um, so we're in First Peter chapter 1, I'm um, First Peter chapter 2, rather. Uh, I want to look at the first 10 verses as we jump into this and um, in the time that we have this morning. First Peter 2, verses 1 through 10, God's word says this. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and evil and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Indeed, you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the build, builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evil doers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, once again we are here submitting ourselves to the Bible. And Lord, we ask for your grace. We ask for your spirit's enablement to teach and preach. And for your spirit's illumination to understand the word. These are spiritual matters. The flesh can't understand. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the spirit of God. They're spiritual. So we need you to open our eyes to see the wonderful truths in your law. Lord, would you take these things and plant them in our hearts, shape your people, edify your people, encourage your people, convict those that need to be convicted. And Lord, that you would do all of this for your glory and our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember my grandmother, before she went to be with the Lord, would, when she would be speaking of family, and she was from a large family, um, I, I think there was like seven or eight girls and one boy, um, and I never met that uncle, that, that great uncle, um, but I'm guessing he was either pampered or spoiled or an antagonist, I've just tried to imagine that. But there, So as you know, at, with a large family and things grow out, there becomes lots of groups and herds of grandchildren to different things and my grandma would often say that certain things like when certain people would come in the room maybe when she was in the hospital or something people like that she would say this phrase and maybe you've used this phrase these are my people like like she'd say like when we when the grandkids would come in she these are my people that this is this is where i belong this is the people i belong around 
And there's a certain sense in which when you, that, that image that we have is one of the images that God gives of the church. And last week we introduced this idea when we talked about the nature of the church, how the Bible uh, gives us, one of the main ways that the Bible teaches us about the doctrine of the church is by giving us several images in the Bible about the nature of the church. And so we, we mentioned that when we, when we look at the Bible and the way the Bible presents the, God, the doctrine of the church, and let me just back up to say that the Bible is the authority on the nature of the church. It is sufficient on the life of the church. We are not given up to our own devices, our own imagination, everything. The Bible is central, and we talked about that before, how the sufficiency of the Bible in the life of the church, and that frees us from the tyranny of calendars and traditions and human opinions to just focus on the Bible. Um, but the, the, when the Bible, it speaks of the nature of the church, and it doesn't particularly speak primarily about the church. When we study the church, we often look at it from a functional way or a, uh, a, a mission way from like a function or purpose. And we, so you'd even see books and phrases. And there's a little bit, there's some truth in all these things, like a purpose-driven church or a missional church or a church for this or this. You, you, but they talk about functionality and mission and all those things. But when the Bible talks about the church, it primarily speaks in ontological ways, uh, by that I mean the nature of it. And so we spoke about how ontology trumps autonomy, that the nature of something is set by God, and you can't just say, like, like I mentioned before, that, that you can't just say, uh, I'm, I'm 30 years old instead of whatever. Uh, you can't just say, I'm this age or this height when one isn't. Um, and, and we gave the illustration of the duck's and the prairie chickens to illustrate that as we talked about that last week. Um, but as we come into this idea that there is an assembly and so that, that the church is central to Jesus, his person and his program as he is building his church. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. A church that he purchased with his own blood. But that the assembly has an assembler. And that Jesus is assembling the body, the church, and he does that by means of the gospel. So he assembles people spiritually and physically in union with Christ and in union with each other. This body of Christ, and then that we are baptized into his body, Romans 6, that we are one body, 1 Corinthians 12, that he brings us into this through union with Jesus. And then we introduce those huge ideas of um, that the church then is both invisible and visible, both local and universal. Uh, and then as we finished up last week, we talked about the attributes of the true church versus a false truth, that there is a unity, a holiness, a universality, and a devotedness to the, uh, uh, the apostles' doctrine or the Bible. So then when we come to this, um, much of the nature of the church is determined by those images of the church. Uh, one scholar uh, noted at least conservatively 80 of them, and you could probably round up to other books have cited 96 or 100 images or metaphors for the church in the Bible. Um, so when you think about that, we're just going to go ahead and start taking one at a time and just work through those, okay? I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, I'm see if anyone's made this. <laughs> and um, when you think about, wow, there's like 80 to 100 images or metaphors for the church um, in the Bible. What do you do with that? And what we're doing right now is, a, is, is some logic and theology. Okay, we have all these different images for the church. How are we supposed to respond to that? So, how do we understand scriptures like this? And, and, you, and this is a principle of Bible study. Of what do you do when you want to look at a topic or a doctrine or a position in the Bible, and there's multiple texts in the Bible, some that are very clear and others that might not seem to fit, what do you do? How does this work? Um, this is what the Bible scholars would call the analogy of Scripture, or letting the Scriptures interpret the Scriptures. Or I like to say it this way, every text counts. 
that every text gets a voice. So, so what we need to be careful of is that, that we let it do that, okay? Even if it doesn't fit into our position or our box, we need to let every text count. Now that might lead us to take more complicated positions if we're going to let every text count, right? But you could think about issues of um, whether that be end times. You know, that's a big one. And people say, well, this is the clear thing. Well, what about this passage? Ooh, how does that fit into that position? I don't know. Or I'll just ignore that passage. Is that an option? No, right? Uh, divorce and remarriage in the church. Well, uh, God's this and this is just clear and you just got to stand on conviction. Well, what about this passage? Oh, you got to let every text count, right? Now that leads us to some complicated positions, right? You ever look at the maps and charts of an end times book? Good night. How complicated can you get, right? But you know what I appreciate the guys doing that? Is they're trying to let every text speak. I had a teacher say it this way. Buy your theology by the text, not by the kit. Okay? Uh, let, let, buy, but, but the scripture. Buy it by the piece of scripture rather than the kit. So don't just come and say, well, I'm an Arminian. Or I'm a Calvinist. And I'm going to look at every verse of the Bible from that perspective. Or I'm a dispensationalist. Or I'm a not a dispensationalist. Or I'm a... Whatever it is, and that's the grid by which you look at the Bible, and that's the only way you see it. But let the Bible speak. Let the Bible be the Bible. Let every text speak. Now, what's going to happen is as you line up all of those, you're like, you know what? This position accounts, I think, gives the best account for the majority or the most or all of the texts of Scripture when you look at it together. So I can have that kit or that system or that position or whatever is identified in that way. But I want to buy my theology not by the kit, but by the text. Let the text speak. Does that make sense? I hope it does. We can talk about that later. I know that's a little more than Sunday morning sermon stuff. Um, so all of the Bible is inspired, and all of these images for the church are given to us in the Bible, but they're not to be interchangeable. So there's, so, so there's a, a breadth to them. And you can see, and often people get in weird positions of the, and claim the Bible's basis when they take one passage of Scripture and oppose another passage of Scripture and ignore it. You know, So they would say, well, it says to just baptize in Jesus' name. Well, what about the Matthew account where it says to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Nope, only in Jesus' name baptism. You're like, wait, you've got to let every text speak, right? And so when it comes to, some people could say, well, it says the church is a body, and the body is this. So say, okay, but it says that one here, but a different way of using the body image. It uses the body image in Corinthians that we're all part of it, and ear, eyes, ears, nose, things like that. But then when it talks in Colossians, it speaks in the body image, but with, with Jesus as the head, and that we're submission and dependent upon it. So it's the same image used in different ways. Or that, that we, or some people would say, we're only going to focus on it as the people of God. Or some people will push that, that body image of the church too far to where they think that there's some type of... Um, ongoing incarnation of Jesus in the church and it comes in some sacramental or vicarious or something that you might see in um, a Catholic or an Episcopal model of church. Or you might only focus on the, asp the image of the church of it being the fellowship of the Spirit and then you could see certain groups, maybe more Pentecostal tradition, that would really hone in on that image of the church as opposed to maybe some of the others about people of God or body or household or these different ones. So what do we do when we have 80 to 100 images of the church? Well, a couple options uh, that I think are really good is to let each of them speak and understand that the church is such a beautiful and big thing and central to the, the mission of God and his program in this age that he wants us to see it uh, with a multitude of ways with a breadth. Or as Mark Dever said it this way, that the riches of descriptions of the church teaches us that no single image can comprehend all aspects of the church. Or Wayne Grudem said it this way in his systematic. He said, the wide range of metaphors used for the church in the New Testament should remind us to, fo to not focus exclusively on any one. 
So each of the metaphors for the church can help us appreciate something of the riches and the privileges of being incorporated and born into and saved into the church and not overemphasizing one or the other. So the church is described in scriptures as the people of God, body of Christ, temple of the Holy Spirit, a living organism, unified, true believers, all of this. And so there's a lot of these. So what are we going to do? Well, I'm just going to try to clump a few of them together um, in some ideas. So we're going to have clump metaphors today, okay? Mixed metaphors, mixed clump together, okay? That was a literal joke, okay. All right. The first one is the one that you read about this morning in John 15. You read this in the opening, um, uh, opening of our service. M- John 15, there are many, m- many metaphors from nature. So turn with me to John 15. Many of the metaphors or images of the church come from nature, and they're kind of clumped together with this idea. So, for instance, in uh, Romans 11, it says that the the church is an olive tree, and uh, this wild olive branch grafted into, the Gentiles are grafted into this wild olive branch, that there's this field of crops. So a, a tree, crops, a harvest in Matthew 12, that this harvest is coming, stones, that are built around a cornerstone that we read there in 1 Peter 2. So these ideas from nature, a tree, crops, harvest, stones, and then here in John 15, so I'm clumping these nature metaphors together, and then John 15, that vine and branches. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every one that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. And it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. Israel had been typified as a vine that had failed to produce the desired fruit. And against that image, in the Old Testament, Jesus symbolized himself as the true vine. And that his followers, his disciples, his people would be in organic union. Remember we talked about union with Christ? A vine is in union. The branch is in union with the vine. There is an organic connectedness. And we are to abide in him. So church, get this. You have to be connected to Jesus. We got to stay connected to Jesus. We're the vine and branches. He's the vine. We're the branches. Abide in Him. Fruit bearing depends upon a relationship between the vine and the branch. It, the, the power for production flows only one way from the vine. Abiding in the vine. The production of fruit is. Has, is, is the one requirement of the branch. He wants us to do this, to bear fruit. Abide. Abide means it's an inward or enduring or a personal communion the, 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 with God. And then there's fruit that comes from that communion that we saw in verse 8 there, that you bear much fruit. Um, the, the nature of that fruit is not defined here in John 15, but we let every text speak, right? The, but the, it is characterized, the fruit, singular, in Galatians, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no law, right? It gives us this picture of the characteristics of this fruit. Um, and in the context there's of, of John 15, there's joy and love. In verse 9, it says that, that uh, as my Father loved me, so I abide in, in my, abide in my love. Um, 
these things I've spoken, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So this union of vine and branch is in this context of joy and love. But there's another lesson we can learn about this vine. That's a very good devotional thought, right? That I need to be and you need to be and we as a church need to be connected and abiding in the vine. And that's a good lesson. And that sometimes, that's very sentimental. We, we, we put plaques up about that and put it on our coffee mugs and things like that. But there's another lesson from the image of the vine that isn't as fun and sentimental. And he says that branches that don't bear fruit, he purges them, that they may bear more fruit. That further production of fruit requires purging, requires pruning. So when you're going through a trial, don't think that our vineman is hurting us without purpose or cause. He, he's, he's pruning exactly where he needs to be and dress and what needs to be cut off, what is hurting flow, what is not producing fruit, what's going to produce more fruit and more health for us in the long run. And so we just know that we are to stay abiding in the vine. So the picture of the vine pictures this vital relationship between members of the church and Christ. We need to be Christ-centered as a church if we're going to live up to what he's made us to be. We're to be branches connected and abiding in a vine. Jesus needs to be the center. Abiding in him is our means of life and fruitfulness. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So then, so that's a clump around, uh, uh, of metaphors around nature. Then there's this huge clump that I want to get to, is this idea of people of God. These are familial, or family, or relational. Like I mentioned my grandma, those are my people. And, and that several images can be clumped as familial. And Paul and Timothy, in 1 Timothy 5, he tells Timothy, Don't rebuke older men, but exhort them as a father. Treat younger men like a brother. Older women as mothers, and younger women like sisters and all purity. We are brothers and sisters. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe we are brothers and sisters in here? And remember when we were looking through, walking through 1 John and finishing up that 1 John this spring, that love for the brethren was a birthmark of salvation. This forever family, that we are brothers and sisters. In fact, if you look at what Jesus says, that how in the resurrection we're not married or given in marriage, and that we raise kids for the purpose of shooting them out like arrows in the Psalms, marriage and family are temporary for this age, but the church is forever. So your brothers and sisters in your church are a forever family. The church is described as the people of God. We saw that in 1 Peter 2. It's also in 1 Corinthians 6. And this distinction marks us off from all ages as one people, the bride of Christ. Revelation tells us in Ephesians the picture that the purpose of marriage is to picture Christ and his church and how the church is the bride of Christ. But then in Revelation 21, it describes her as, uh, describes the church, and I encourage you to look at this, in Revelation 21, verses 9 to 14, it describes the church as represented from the apostles and Israel and represented by the tribes. And you're like, whoa, that, 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 that passage in, in, in Revelation 19 and Revelation 21, that didn't fit in my box of what the nature of the church in relationship to Israel was for a long time. Okay? Um, I mean, that, but I got to order my theology by the text, not by the kit. Right? Okay? And so, so this, this one means of salvation through all ages, Jesus, the atoning work by means of faith alone. So the church is part of this bride of Christ. So the people of God, how do we become this people of God? Well, Ephesians told us. He chose us. We're cho Ephesians 1, verse 5, we're chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. God's 
elect, Romans 8. Don't let that word scare you. Colossians 3, he calls the church his elect in 1 Peter 1. In 2 Timothy 2, this elect race. In 1 Peter 2, he says, these ones that are chosen, these ones that are here. In Romans 8, Eight, there are those that he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. Being chosen of God and elected, the church belongs to God. It says there in 1 Peter 2 that we read at our beginning, that a people, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Being chosen by God, being his people, means that we, the church belongs to God. Or as Jesus said, I will build my church. It's his. A people for his own possession. He calls them, he calls them, and whosoever, who, so well, how do I know if I'm one of the elect? Do you want to be? Whosoever will may come. There's no, there's no, there's no contention here, okay? Um, and, and so, 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 it changed, those that are called are changed to be called saints. They're made holy. They're in Christ. And they're done that way. They are regenerated. They're made alive. They're made into a new family. How do they get into this new family, this people of God? They are born again. Washed in the water, born of this spirit, washed in the blood. They're called Christians. They're called disciples. They're called brethren, brothers and sisters. Family has love one for another. We are brought into this family of love. The, to these young Christians that Peter would have been addressing, they're having a hard time struggling with their identity in the world around them. Don't we do that still? Our, finding our identity in the world, and especially as identity becomes such a big thing in politics and everything. And he encourages them, and us by nature of it being in the scriptures, that find their primary identity, not in their ethnicity or their background or their socioeconomic background, but what they are, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. This is our identity. Whereas the illustration I used last week, wearing the same jersey, cheering for the same team, with somebody else's last name on the back of that jersey, no matter which background we are, because there's one goal that he's made a new people. How do you solve racial tension? How do you solve socioeconomic disparagely between people? Preach the gospel. He makes us one. We are encouraged then to find our distinction and our identity in being the people of God. Find this as your main identity. We are made that way by the redemptive work of Jesus. You are a holy nation. Like Abraham called out of Ur to raise up a people to his name, a, a sands of sea, he makes this, his church this holy nation. They have this family identity. And families are to act like a large... Churches should act like a large family. And I have never seen a family that had it all together and didn't have it, some level of dysfunction about it. So come on in. We're messed up too. Right? That's what it's all about. Is, 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 I often, when someone says, well, I don't want to go to church, there's a lot of hypocrites there. I'm like, well, great, you'll fit in. So we're to treat each other as brothers and sisters, as older, younger, treat other younger women with purity like sisters, older men as fathers, older women as mothers. God is our heavenly father, Ephesians 3. 2 Corinthians 6, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We are brothers and sisters, each in God's family. We are from the same womb. We have been born through Christ. Think of that. We are from the same womb, the gospel. And the evidence of our salvation will show in our love for one another. So let's be a family. Or as I close as the 20th century songwriter put it this way. 
you will notice that we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by the blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. From the door of an orphanage to the house of a king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God I belong. Because I'm glad to be part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by the blood. Joy heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. These two clumps of these nature images, that particularly the vine and the branch, these family images of people of God, the family of God, would you let this think about the nature of the church, that that would grow? And if you're here and you're like, this sounds like I'm at somebody else's family reunion and I don't fit in, you're welcome. In fact, Jesus said in the most famous verse ever, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he said in that same, just a couple chapters earlier, but as many as received him, to them gave he the ability, the power, the authority, the access to become sons of God. This is a family that you're invited to be part of. And you become part of it through adoption. And he wants to adopt you. He's chosen you for adoption. And he invites you to do it, and you come by belief in Christ. And if there's a desire in there, that's not of yourself, that's of him doing, of him drawing you to that. So we invite you to believe on Christ. And, the same, and you can praise God, you're not worthy, but you can belong in the family of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you give us all these pictures and metaphors of the church just to, to give us things we see. That we, some of us have vines and trees in our yards that we can think that, that we need to stay connected to Jesus. Help us to stay connected to Jesus. Help us to remember that our nature as a church is, is not primarily as an organization, as a structure, but as a family. And Lord, I thank you for saving me and bringing me into the family of God. And I thank you that you're still doing that. And it's to your glory that we say this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we have a closing song.